Hello, BookTube. All right, we're continuing with my library tour for 2022. Uh, we're going shelf by shelf, one video per shelf so far. That's not going to stay true when we get to mass market paperbacks. Uh, as a visual guide to what I have here at the beginning of the year, and for this time, for this book uh, library tour, I started in the little book room, my little book room, my, my little uh, fortress of solitude here, my sanctum sanctorum, uh, space that I have replicated everywhere I have ever lived or have tried to. Uh, usually it's been smaller than this. This has a high ceiling and it's, it's, most of you would probably consider a very small room, but it's not small enough for me. I want basically a walk-in closet, only the kind that has a window at the back. I, I like a window in my little space. And I've had little spaces like that that I have crammed with more dogs than you would think possible. Here I've got a nice ample space and only one tiny little dog <laughs> to fill it. Uh, but we're, we're on to the next shelf here. I am sitting down, uh, I think I have just this one shelf of blessed peace of sitting down and then the next two I think I have to be sitting on the floor slowly listening as the southern outposts go mute <laughs> but for now we have the nice peace and comfort of a chair so we'll do the uh the, the transverse books first to get the clear off the shelf and the first one is an old modern library paperback of Walter Pater's The Renaissance uh which I guess I should put here <laughs> to get rid of this wall uh, I was afraid that the more of the wall I got rid of, the more backlit I'd be. Uh, but I guess that doesn't matter, right? We'll just, we'll just leave it like this. Uh, this is was once upon a time the most read monograph on any historical subject that had ever been. Uh, it was absolutely universal. People could quote huge chunks of it. People knew if you were writing a piece about the Renaissance and you were even lightly plagiarizing, everyone knew what you were doing because they all knew this book. That is not true anymore, of course, <laughs> but once upon a time it was. It makes for terrific reading. Walter Pater, I can't vouch for his, uh, his historical novel, Marius the Epicurean, but I can definitely vouch for the Renaissance. The Renaissance is still really, really good. Uh, and then the other Transwise books is one of these Barnes & Noble fake leather-bound editions, one of the beautiful jobs that they do. Uh, they are really collectible items. A lot of them are collectible items, and this is their doom uh, with the... the gold gilt pages there and the built-in bookmark. Just a, an absolutely lovely thing. And ornithopters against a, an Arakeen sunset. Uh, just a lovely, lovely thing. That's the reason why I got it. I do not need any more copies of Dune. I think we've seen already one. Yeah, we saw one copy of Dune already, and I think there's another one in this room. Uh, but that clears off the shelf. So now we can just uh, progress with the books. Uh, so what is this first one? Oh, great. Okay. This is a little... Uh, niche interests of mine, <laughs> English country houses, and not only what they are in history, uh, for that there is a great book that we will get to, the English country house in history, but uh, but also just their floor plans, their grounds, their history, not in any sociological sense, but just who's lived there and what they did to it. Uh, I find that subject absolutely fascinating. I don't know if I would find it so fascinating if I didn't have first-hand experience of all of these houses, but I have. I've been in uh, pretty much all of them, at very least as a tourist, and I've been in a number of them as a guest. So that adds an element of personal involvement to the story. And this is by Robin Fedden and John Kenworthy Brown, so I'm assuming they have a country house, judging, judging by those names. And this is the Country House Guide. Uh, just a normal-sized hardcover. A lot of times with Country House books you won't find a normal-sized hardcover. And this has both uh, color and black and white. Uh, color pictures of what the houses look like now and archival photos of what they used to look like running all throughout, plus floor plans. So this is uh, really a one-stop guide to a lot of these houses that I know so well. I know a lot of English history was written in, in country houses. You wouldn't believe it, but it's true. And it's an amazing feeling. I don't know how many of you have done it. It's an amazing feeling uh, to start out in London uh, or wherever, or Leeds, as I did many, many times, and you're driving for a long time in the countryside, and that's pretty enough as it is, and then all of a sudden you're driving on a, a road that doesn't appear to have any signs, and then for a long time you're driving in what seems to be the outskirt of a park of some kind, and all of that belongs to the house. <laughs> You've been driving for 45 minutes on land that belongs to the house, and eventually you get to a beautiful, just beautiful, ornate old building, and you think, wow, pretty nice. And then if you're in if you're in the right company, your host will say, well, no, that's that's just uh, the porter's house. <laughs> that that's the gateway to the main grounds. The main house is still a ways away, and it's bigger than that. <laughs> so so I, I maybe it's that personal history that mixes in, but I have a feeling I would probably find the subject fascinating anyway. Uh, then we have a relatively new book. Uh, this is by Daniel Ogden, and it is uh, the Werewolf in the Ancient World. 
from Oxford University Press. Not a long thing. I would want this to be ten times as long. Uh, the, the, all this, the, it's the subject of uh, the werewolf lore, of transforming, people transforming into wolves, voluntarily or otherwise. Uh, this goes through all of the mentions in ancient sources that we have, Greek and Roman, and it's very, very good. Uh, it's, it's, it would be the kernel of reconstituting the giant uh, literature of the werewolf library that I once had. I once had 100 books on the subject of werewolves, past and present, historical studies and modern studies. And I went through it all the time. I don't know where that library ended up. I, I really don't. I miss it. It's, it's one of the few uh, segments of my per personal library that I wish I still had. I'm kind of waiting for the day that a big tranche of horror or supernatural elements shows up at the Brattle Bookshop where I might be able to reconstitute a lot of that werewolf library. Uh, I find it fascinating, and not just for the obvious reasons. <laughs> uh, this next one is from Princeton. This came out of the blue to me one day. I did not expect it, did not know it was coming, and it overjoyed me, absolutely overjoyed me. Did this come before we were talking to each other? July of 2016. So no, not quite, but maybe I wasn't in the habit of showing you everything. This is a standalone version of... Uh, edited by Tom Jones of An Essay on Man by Alexander Pope. Uh, so I, I have collected Pope volumes, but this is just an essay on man standing on its own with elaborate footnotes, elaborate introduction, elaborate endnotes. Uh, really, really neat addition to have. I could didn't know it was coming. It felt like a personal gift because I, I love the poem, even though if you think about what it's saying for even half a minute, you realize how incredibly silly it is as a poem. Uh, it's still beautiful. Uh, then what do we got here? Oh, this is colorful. Oh my. <laughs> okay, this is by Joanna Lindsay, the romance author. This is when passion rules. And rules and passion are sitting on both sides of Paul Marin's tushy <laughs> as the window curtain blows, no doubt in admiration. <laughs> and this is uh, a Ruritania novel. This is a Grostark novel. This is a, a, a tiny teacup kingdom in Europe where uh, an, out, an outsider goes there and finds love and romance. Uh, it's a, a time-honored tradition. I'm pretty sure that Joanna Lindsay knew that when she wrote this book. Uh, I wrote about this. If I can remember, I will try and find a link to it. Uh, I had a fun time writing about this and about Grostark fiction just in general. All, the name taken from uh, a series of novels from 100, 120 years ago that were really, really popular. Once upon a time, the Grostark novels were really, really popular. They're gone. No one's ever going to reprint them, but they are, they are enormous amounts of fun. If you ever find them, they're enormous amounts of fun. Uh, then we have a book that has a long history on this channel. Again, a link is probably in order. This is Julian by Gore Vidal, a hardcover novel that I found in rotten shape and uh, reinforced in this way that, that horrifies the collectors among you, but I don't plan to resell this. Uh, and so it can be thrown away when I die for all I care. I'm, I'm not expecting it to go to a collector, and it's certainly not in the hands of one. And this is his historical novel about Julian the Apostate, the Roman emperor who thought, well, enough of this Christianity thing, let's go back to our pagan gods. Uh, Gore Vidal researched it pretty thoroughly, and he writes it really, really entertainingly, really engagingly. And uh, the reason that it has a long history on this channel is because a long time ago I did one of my book repair videos about this book, where I actually I took the rotten dust jacket that I had and, and reinforced it. Uh, and if I can remember, again, I will leave a link. I should leave a link to all of these things, to anything that I wrote about. Like this next one, pretty sure that I wrote about this. This is Justin Peters' book on Aaron Schwartz. Uh, it's called The Idealist, and those of you who don't know, that superimposed in the background there is a young man named Aaron Schwartz, who uh, you might not know his name, but you would if he were still alive. He, he would be ruling the digital world if he were still alive. And even young as he was, in his 20s, in his teens, he helped, was instrumental in or solely invented basic aspects of the internet that you use every day. Uh, he was... Uh, really smart. He was really uh, an ingrown toenail. He was his own worst enemy, and he proved that at the in the end in the worst way that anyone can. He killed himself. Because he, it looked like he was facing some troubles. Uh, it's hard not to feel angry about that, even now, after all this time. It's hard not to feel angry about that, that stupid, stupid decision from a young man who had made very few stupid decisions. The reason why he killed himself was because of legal trouble brought on by one of the only other big stupid decisions that he ever made in his life. Uh, and this is one of a few books uh, that have come out on him. I think he, he, that subject, that wave, is now gone, so I don't think we'll see any more Aaron Schwartz books, but I think the few books are in this room. Um, pretty raw subject, even now. 
and I think I wrote about it. And I know I wrote about this next one. This is The World Without Us by Alan Weissman. This is his great book. See, you can see on the cover, you've got a dividing line there. On top is a skyline of buildings. On the bottom is a skyline of trees. And that's because this book is about, he does an elaborate thought experiment. What would happen if humanity disappeared today, instantly? All of it. Not dying out over time, but instantly. Uh, and he games out every situation that he can think of. What would happen in cities? What would happen to sewage plants? What would happen to nuclear reactors, both on the mainland and on nuclear vessels? What would happen to everything? And what would recover and what wouldn't? And how fast? And it's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. If you haven't read this book, and maybe, like for instance, maybe you haven't read this book and you're leery of nonfiction just in general, this is a perfect example of what you're missing when you don't read nonfiction. You're missing great stuff like this. Uh, but if you haven't read it and you, you don't mind nonfiction, find it because it's well worth your time. Uh, uh, this next one is a favorite of mine. I found it in, this is uh, an Athenaeum paperback. Uh, I'd only had mass market paperbacks before this and they didn't hold up well, so I got a paperback, a, a nice a trade size paperback and reinforced it. If I found a hardcover of this, I would probably grab it. Uh, this is by H.F. Uh, Saint and it is The Memoirs of an Invisible Man. Uh, and it, it takes off the basic premise of H.G. Wells' famous novel, The Invisible Man, where a, a man turns invisible. And what would happen if you turned invisible and couldn't turn back visible? What would happen? Now, in H.G. Wells' book, the man is a moral degenerate and gets worse as the novel goes on and is, is therefore, once his presence is known, treated as a wild animal. But H.G. Wells makes a very good point in his book. He, he says that there is no power like invisibility. The only problem with his invisible man is that his invisible man doesn't feel like he has any power. He is fairly easy to thwart. This book is a kind of modern update, a modern retelling of that. The main character goes to a scientific exhibition and it goes awry. And when he wakes up, he thinks he's floating 20 feet above the ground in a crater. But really he's not. It's just that the, the floor and the ground is invisible in that crater and so is he. He realizes that he can't see himself and no one else can see him. And suddenly he is faced with a whole host of mundane problems. He's faced with big problems down the line. What is this invisibility? How actually does it work? If I eat some food, how long will it stay visible in my digestive tract before it dead goes invisible? Uh, but he's also faced with mundane problems. Like, for instance, how does he get back home? How does he get back home from that exhibition, right? There are crowds all around. There are emergency vehicles all around. His car is still in the parking lot. It's totally un undamaged. He still has the keys. But he has no idea which key is the right one because he can't see them. <laughs> and even if he figures that out, how is, he, how is he supposed to drive back to the city? How is he supposed to not attract attention in a car that seems to be driving itself? How is he supposed to work the tolls? Handing change or, or a dollar bill to the toll, to the ticket taker. How is he supposed to do that? How is he supposed to get into his building <laughs> when no one can see him? And on and on it goes from there. Of course, Saint works in a, a, a larger plot where a, the, the government, which was funding the experiment in the first place, realizes that someone is out there who is now invisible and wants to track him down. And how would that work? Uh, and don't, those of you who may know this, a handful of you may know this from an absolutely horrible Chevy Chase movie that was made of this book. Don't judge the book by the movie. There's a rare instance where the, the movie was just awful and the book is fantastic fun. Just fantastic fun. You'll love it. You'll go back to it over and over again. It is so engrossingly fun to read. And to think about, you know, what you would do if you were suddenly invisible. Uh, okay, this next one is one that we that I mentioned just a couple of weeks ago up in Vermont. Uh, Mark Richardson and I did dueling top ten lists of fiction, best fiction, nonfiction, and a nautical nonfiction and best nautical fiction. And for a nautical nonfiction, I mentioned this book, Spring Tides by Samuel Elliott Morrison, again, reinforced, because I got, the copy that I got was, had been shunted from yard sale to yard sale, it wasn't going to hold together, there is our author and his wife, uh, and it's just a, a wonderful collection of nautical memories on the part of the author, very, very good book, I was so happy to find it, that I didn't care what shape the, the dust jacket was in, uh, then we have, uh, this is a great book. It's a great work of, of literary criticism. I don't usually say that. Book reviewing, sure. But actual formula, formulaic literary criticism, most of that is so unbearable that I don't have any kind words to say about it. But this is a, an exception. This is uh, F.O. Mathiasen. This is American Renaissance, Art and Expression in the Age of Emerson and Whitman. 
with a Grant Wood cover there. And this is part of the Barnes & Noble Rediscoveries series of very pretty reprints that they did of non-canonical stuff. So not Thoreau or uh, Dickens or anything, but works that a, an editorial crew in New York City deemed worthy of reprint. There were only a handful of these before Barnes & Noble scaled the whole program back, but I wish that I had them all. I wish that I, they were coming to the store when I was working at Barnes & Noble, and I just, I thought, well, like with so many things that came to Barnes & Noble at the time, I thought, well, this will be here forever. I was dead wrong. I had no idea. I should have snapped up everything that looked the least bit interesting. And I didn't snap this up. I had to wait to get it at the Brattle. But it's a great work of uh, broader scale literary criticism. Uh, then what do we have here? A thin book. Oh, good. Okay, great. This is by Bern Heinrich, the author of Ravens in Winter, which we've already seen on this library tour. I think we've already seen that. This is One Man's Owl. Again, very happy to find this in hardcover. I just was, I grabbed it right away. There is our, our author with two loved ones. <laughs> and this is a story of, Bern Heinrich is one of the great avian natural history writers, and uh, his specialty is corvids, but he, this is a book about being, adopting and being adopted by a wild owl who never actually goes all the way in the some of the domesticated owl books that we've seen, but it stays a wild animal outside the whole time, but they very much get to know each other. And it's delightful. Like everything this author writes, it's just delightful. Uh, and then finally, we'll end the shelf with a great big Megillah of a thing. This is by Jeff, Anne and Jeff Vandermeer. This is the big book of science fiction. And this I had to reinforce just because I go back to this thing a lot more than I thought I would. And it's a trade paperback. I, I, if I saw this at the Brattle in the hardcover, I would probably grab it. Uh, but this is great. These two have a real knack for making really revisitable anthologies. They did one for classic fantasy, modern fantasy. The Big Book of Science Fiction is probably the, my favorite of the things they did, specifically because I was arguing with so many of the inclusions here. I, I, time after time, I was saying, why is this here and not that? And I realized the reason why is the reason that I always praise on this channel when it comes to anthologies, when anthologizers make an actual book out of their anthology, where it's not just they're collecting bits and pieces of other things, but that they're making a coherent vision out of their own book. That's what the Vandermeers do when they make an anthology and have the ambit to do it. That's absolutely true for the big book of classic science, of classic fantasy. I wish the big book of classic fantasy didn't have such an ugly cover, but it's a great anthology. And I think this is even better, and it's even bigger. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I have that. That's fantastic. That will serve me in good stead for New World's November 2022, uh, if we all live that long. <laughs> but anyway, that's the last, the last homely house on the hill. That's the last comfortable shelf. The next two will be done sitting on the floor. So send your thoughts and prayers right now. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to wrap this up. This was fun. This library tour has been a lot of fun for me. And I'm hoping that it's giving you titles that you didn't know about or reminders of things that you want to go and get. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up and I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>